Well, welcome back to our podcast as we're looking at um, Organic Disciples. Today we're looking at Humble Service, and uh, this is podcast five in our series. And we're back again, Pastor Kevin, glad to be here with you today. Good to be here. Uh, I love this topic of mm-hmm. Humble Service, okay. kind of like a, a follow-up to last uh, the last one where we yeah. talked about wholehearted worship, but I didn't feel as good. This yeah. one, I'm like, ah, I've got it. And I'm probably going to have my eyes open to, ah, maybe I don't have this one down as much as I think I do. Um, well, let's just start with what did humble service look like in the days of Jesus? Yeah. As yeah. we're always looking at about how we can be disciples and become yeah. more like him. What did it look yeah. like during his time? And what does it look like today, in, in yeah. your opinion? Yeah, you know, it's interesting that we were talking la- the last podcast about wholehearted worship. You go, there's worship, then there's wholehearted worship. And that, that descriptor is, is important. Well, there's service. Yeah, I do what I serve. But then there's humble service. And that's about, that takes it beyond the action to the condition of the heart. And so you know, in the ancient world, it's interesting. Uh, there's, a, there's a book called uh, Jerusalem in the Times of Jesus by a scholar named uh, Joachim Yermius. And it's considered one of the best... Uh, books on really looking at what was happening in the culture of the broader Jerusalem area in the first century. Mm -hmm. And so like there's an entire uh, section on slavery at that time, because well over 50% of the people that lived in the Roman empire were slaves. And you go fit over 50% of some sort. And in some cases it would be like an indentured Mm -hmm. servitude or somebody would basically sell themselves to somebody else for regular pay to have enough money to live on mm-hmm. like a job in a way. Right. But, but then there were also people that were like, that was more, it was you know, abusive and terrible. It was, it was a whole spectrum. But, but you look and go, okay, what does humble service look like when you're in a culture where there are so many people whose role is, their job is to serve so, others, right? Yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, the picture that we have, and I write about it in the book, and Sherry and I write about it in the book, and also, um, you know, talk about this you know, in John chapter 13, where Jesus, who's God in human flesh, willingly, humbly washes the feet of the disciples. He, he picks one of the tasks that servants did that was kind of what the servant of servants did. Right. One of the, you know, and, and he willingly did it. And so I think, I think in the ancient world, Jesus gives this model of humble service being identifying an act of actual physical service that in this case, where in John 13, where the disciples had gathered in the upper room, they're about to have the last supper and share this final meal together and they're all around the table and all their feet are dirty and by the door is this basin of water you know basin there's water there's a towel and they were there for a household servant to serve people but there was nobody there to serve and so oftentimes in that culture people just volunteer or take care of their own feet but nobody had done it so jesus gets up goes over and begins walking around the table and washing their feet you go that's that's Jesus Christ, who's God in human flesh, the Lord of glory, is willingly washing their feet. So in the ancient world, that's one example. And then, of course, when you continue through the Gospels, uh, right, you know, the final thing in the Gospels, except for the resurrection and the ascension, is the, is the death of Jesus on the cross. And Jesus laying his whole life down on the cross, humbly serving us by bearing our sins, taking our place, paying, for, paying the cost for our sins. Um, that was the heart of Jesus, and Jesus modeled that in that context. So he said, okay, so now what do we do now? How do we, how do we live at lives of humble service? We'll just wash people's feet and die on a cross. <laughs> Boom, right? Done. Nailed it. That's it. That's all it is. It's like, well, no, that's, um, though, that's how Jesus lived. But interestingly, in John 13, again, where after Jesus washes the, pe- the disciples' feet, he sits back at the table, and he actually looks at them, and he says, he says, you call me teacher and Lord, and you're right. That is what I am. And he says, if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. You should do as I have done for you. So he's saying, I've modeled it for you, not just to serve you, but to show you this is how you live. So any follower of Jesus who takes the Bible seriously, who takes the calling of Jesus seriously, is going to say, Man, I got to figure out what humble service looks like in my context. Mm-hmm. What is, I, it's, it's, it's practically it's not washing feet we don't do that in our culture anymore now there's churches that have traditions where they'll do a foot washing service there's youth groups that'll sometimes do we're gonna do a foot washing thing and and that's you know that that's you have to take it back and get the history and the context and and that can be very meaningful and very uh eye-opening but it, it it looks like somebody who is in a work context and there's certain work that doesn't have to be done by them because they've passed that up. I remember when I was in, mm-hmm. when I worked in the restaurant industry and I did, I worked in a couple different restaurants, some of my earlier jobs. Um, there's like a hierarchy right. in the restaurant sure. industry. And so uh, if you become a waiter or if you're on the wait staff, a waiter or waitress, um, 
you don't have to do food prep. You don't have to do a lot of the cleanup. After, you know, you, when you're done with your shift, you leave and the bus staff takes care of that. Absolutely. And the food prep team takes care of stuff for the next day. And so if you say, I'll hang around after my shift is done and I'll help with food prep. Well, first of all, if you're a waiter on the wait staff, you're you're not getting paid anymore. You're done. You know, your time is done. You got your tips. You tipped out. You tipped your, you know, you tipped the bus staff. You tipped other people, and then off you go. Will you hang around for an hour afterwards, and and just help the people with the food prep for the next day? They're going to go. What do you, you know, no, you're not one of us. You're one of them, and 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 almost every place in the world, and every we we are hierarchical people, like it or not, uh, and. And so anytime somebody says, I don't have to do that, I'm not expected to do that, but I'll, I'll do it with a humble heart, which means that humility is an attitudinal thing. Not I'll do this to show something to you or I'll do this because I have to. It's, no, I'd just be glad to help. Mm-hmm. And that, um, that is powerful. And so it looks like anytime we are willing to do something that's not expected of us, not demanded of us, it might even be surprising, but we'll do it and we'll do it with the right heart. I think when we see humble service, we're almost surprised yeah. that we see it. Yeah, and I think it's because it's it's kind of hard in our world today. Yeah. What makes it so hard for humble service to be mm-hmm. prevalent? Yeah. in our yeah. in our world today. Yeah, we're we've kind of become a service industry oriented culture. You know, people used to not eat out. I remember mm-hmm. I remember uh, Sh- Sherry told me growing up that her parents would go out like once or twice a year for dinner to teach the kids how to behave if somebody else took them out to eat. You know, they grew up in the Midwest <laughs> uh, that weren't a real high income. You know, at that time in their lives didn't have a lot. So they just very simple. And so so but but we you know if you say to people you know do you go out to eat once or twice a year? People like most people are like well I go out to eat <laughs> you know once or twice a week or sometimes you know so there's people that almost every meal. And so we're used to, well, I'll sit down, somebody will come, they'll, they'll come and they'll bring me a menu and they'll, what would you like to drink? And they'll bring me a drink. And if, if the food comes, it's not quite the way I like it. I'll, well, by the way, this isn't quite how I prepared right. it. Could I send it back? And, and so you start to live in that kind of environment, not just in dining, but in, you know, if you walk into a store, there's, you, you want good, um, a good salesperson who does a good job, who's attentive and, and you don't always get that, but that's kind of right. the way our culture works. So, so then when, when we look at ourselves, we can look and say, well, I'm a consumer and I come here so you can serve me. I'm not serving you. And it, it, there's a, I think there's a mindset that can become almost a cultural thing. And I think that's very much a part of our, uh, not, not all the world, but where we sit right here. And then you, you go to a place like Monterey, mm. which is a, a, a community built on the service industry, restaurants, resorts, golf courses, it can be even more that way. So, so all of a sudden you have a local church, like a church like Shoreline, and you say, well, we're looking for volunteers. You may have a, you just might have a little tougher time getting volunteers to things where, where they go, well, I, I come and visit Monterey, or I got a home in Monterey, or I live in Monterey, but I'm, I'm more about uh, people serving me than I'm about serving others. And so there's some cultural things. And then I think the probably the most foundational thing that gets in the way of it is just the condition of the human heart. Right. Um, why would I kneel down, bow down, humble myself, bring myself below somebody else to kind of lift them up. When Jesus washed the disciples' feet, you can't wash feet standing up. You have to get on your knees. So the Lord of glory kneels down, washes their feet. Well, why would I do that? And that's why as Christians, we really stand out. If if, if, If humble service becomes a natural part of our lives, we're in a time now where even like stopping and holding the door for somebody. People go like, oh, thank you. Like that's, wow. It's like, no, no, it took me three seconds and I held a door. But there's times people are are almost like surprised because it's not normative, but in a way that gives an open door for us to shine the light of Jesus. If it seems so unique and amazing, let's just do it more. Yeah, Yeah. every time I hold a door for someone and I get that reaction, it it actually saddens me. Mm -hmm. Uh, I I would want them to have that reaction if I didn't open the door. Um, Again, we always go back to Jesus because that's what we're seeking to do is become more like him. In Matthew 11, they, there's a clear picture that Jesus is wanting to bring rest to the weary mm. and he's wanting to restore our souls. Yeah. In contrast to that, you've got the, the leaders of, of that time, the powerful people mm. at that time, not quite yeah. having that same outlook. Mm-hmm. And I'm guessing that even today it's not that way. How do mm. you see Jesus' approach to, to mm-hmm. caring for others yeah. differing from the leaders back then yeah. and even those today? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, there's there's different little maxims or sayings about how time changes things, but there, there's a, there's a line: the more things change, the more they stay the same. Right. And there's certain things that you go, you look through history, and the human tendency, 
that the higher you achieve, the more money you make, the more influence you have, the more power you amass to yourself, um, the more you see yourself as worthy of others serving you and the less prone you might be to humbly serve other people. Right. In the ancient world of Jesus' day, the religious leaders were um, were educated, were influential, were they had the best seats at parties and the best seats at at, uh, at religious gatherings. They had, they had they there was a certain status that came with it, and Jesus comes in and just kind of blows that up, because he comes in as the Messiah that they're waiting for, as the one that they say that they worship, and he doesn't have that attitude at all. Mm-hmm. He comes to serve, and, and, and you know, the the. Um, I think it's uh, Mark ten forty five right. says, "For the Son of Man came not to serve, but to be. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Mm-hmm. So not just to serve, but to die. Right. And so now you turn to our world today, and I would say it's almost no different. When when you you know, and and this is why as as a pastor and anyone who serves in a role of 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 you know sort of religious leadership, whatever you know term you want to use for it." Um, we have to be so careful and watch ourselves and guard our hearts. And, and so, you know, there's a reason why um, we don't have uh, parking spots with the pastor's names on it. And now there's churches that may do that and that's more power to them, whatever. I, although I, I disagree. I think that's really bad. <laughs> if the best spot saved for the pastors, you're sending the wrong message. So I was going to be kind, but I'm not going to be kind. I'm just going to be declarative there. Um, but, but if, but if you look and say, you know, why should that person have special privilege? Why should that be person seen as more valuable and more important? If anything, um, those in the higher levels of leadership should be looking for ways to to be humbly serving others and finding ways to care for them. And so I, I shared this, uh, I think, in a church service recently, but Sherry and I went out for a hike um, two Saturdays ago. And right as we started our hike, we ran into a person who's never been to Shoreline. They go to Shoreline now, but they're going online. And then we talked to another person who has not been to Shoreline for a long We talked to a couple people that are connected with the Shoreline, but in both cases, they kind of apologize. They say, I don't, we don't need to bother you, but, you know, and, and Shoreline is, is a larger church and we have a lot of people online and some new people that have started coming to Shoreline during COVID, so they haven't been on campus, so I haven't met them face to face. But when people say, oh, I'm sorry, I don't mean to bother you, but I'm like, no, we, we that's not bothering us. We love people. We I'm a pastor and Sherry, both Sherry and I, we love people. Don't apologize. Just, you know, I mean, nice conversations mm-hmm. kind of stopped and prayed with both of them kind of along the side of the trail D- at different times. You know, it was that's like one me. and then about five minutes later prayed with somebody else. But it wasn't like, hey, I'm the pastor. I'm out here for a walk here. Uh, it's my day off. Uh, what are you bugging me for? Or uh, it, it's just like, no, this is, this is, um, you love people. You care for people. But, but if you're not careful, and I'll say not just, you, if I'm not careful, um, I can start to kind of buy my own press or buy other people's press and think, well, aren't I special? Aren't I a big deal? Mm-hmm. And we got to watch out for that kind of stuff because the enemy will get in and corrupt our hearts that way. Well, Jesus taught a lot about humility. So I know we're doing yep. humble service, but, yep. but just on humility for a moment, why do you think it was so important, such a major theme for yeah. him yeah. Um, yeah. To, to really hit on humility? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, there's a lot there. One thing I would say is that humility kind of shows that we have things in the right in the right perspective. We have things in the right place. And it's easy to get things inverted, to flip things and not realize what our place is. And so I think Jesus taught humility because it's hard for us to be humble. He taught humility because our culture doesn't push people towards humility. It pushes people towards pride and self-centeredness. And I think Jesus called us to and taught humility because it really is the best way to live because you understand who you are. And I, years ago, um, I was, I went to, there was a thing called Promise Keepers. And some mm-hmm. people, listeners might remember, you know, the, there's all these conferences and different things for men. And I went to, I was, went to a big Promise Keeper event in Detroit. And at the event, they asked everyone to think about one way, this is if you're married, what's one way you can go home when you go home that you can serve your wife? And so on the bus driving home with this whole group from our church, people were, you know, one guy said, well, I decided I was going to, um, one guy said I was going to give my wife like two certificates for a romantic evening. And the guy's laughing, that's not serving her. And they kind of had a good time. And then another guy said, well, I'm going to do uh, like wash the dishes or you know, do the dish, and load the dishwasher for like the, the next two weeks or something. And, and I'm listening, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I overshot. Because I decided, and we actually were all asked to kneel down in, in this, and it was actually in the stadium where the, where the Lions played. So the, this, the floors, I mean, the, the, 
it was not real clean, but we all right. knelt down and prayed about it. And I came away making a commitment that I would make the bed and pray for my wife every morning is the first thing I do of the day until Jesus returns or until I die. So I realized it's, it, that was a little bit bigger than just, you know, a couple of certificates, uh, sn- yeah. snuggly certificates kind of thing. But um, so I told I told all these guys, and they all grow. And they're like, oh, man, you overdid it. You overshot. But the beauty of it is now 25 years later. Yeah, 25 more than that. Um, I try to I, I pick occasionally when I think about that, I'll figure out how many how many times I've made the bed. And then how many pillows, because on our bed, there's like, there's the three pillows you can use, then you have to put the quilt up. Right. And then there's the two big pillows you can't use. And then there's the two other fancy pillows you can't use. And there's two of the smaller fancy ones you can't use. And there's the one center fancy one you can't use. So there's two, four, six, seven ones that you can't use and three that you can't. So that's 10 pillows. So I figured out one time how many pillows I've fluffed and, and gotten, you know, ready for the day over the thousands and thousands oh, yeah. of times I've done this. Thing. And, and I thought, but I'm so grateful because what the way my day begins is making the bed and fluffing the pillows and putting everything back where it goes and praying for my wife. So as I start my day, it's mm-hmm. like, this is who I am. I'm the guy who makes the bed and fluffs the pillows. And not, then I can come to Shoreline and I get to be the lead pastor, right. <laughs> but I'm the guy who makes the bed and fluffs the pillows. That's that's who I am. And if it's the first thing I do, it kind of just calibrates my soul for the day. Yeah, absolutely. Because And here's the funny thing is when I'm not at home, if I'm traveling, if I'm even traveling alone, I still make the bed and get all the pillows done so I can pray for my wife. It's such a habit for me. I'm a person of habit. And so, and Sherry will sometimes say, well, after you make the bed, then kind of pull it down because you don't want them to think that it wasn't used and then they don't change the sheets for the next person. That's so great. anyways, um, but that's part of my story of trying to grow in this thing. Yeah. Well, you referenced Mark 10 45. For yeah. even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve yeah. and is give his life as a ransom for many. Mm-hmm. That's a big verse. I, yeah. I think that's a, a good one for us to yeah. commit to memory and yeah. to spend our yeah. life focusing on. Because it's about the cross. Yeah. How is the cross the, mm. the ultimate yeah. Yeah. Uh, example of yeah. humble service? Yeah. Yeah, you know, foot washing is a great picture and one we often look at right. in the, the Jesus example there. But but the cross is the ultimate act of service. It's, it's you know, where Jesus laid down his full life and not just... So often on the, on the cross, we focus on the physical pain that Jesus went through, which was excruciating. But the relational rejection he went through, the spiritual torment and weight, that, that torment he felt and the weight that he carried on the cross is beyond our comprehension. To bear the wrath for sin that we deserve, that all people who would ever receive the grace of Jesus for that wrath to be placed on him on the cross. And so for Jesus, the, 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 his death on the cross, his sacrifice, is sort of the ultimate final act of serving physically, serving spiritually, serving emotionally, serving relationally. He gave everything so that we could come home and be with the Father. Mm-hmm. And so I think when you look at the cross, you see Jesus, the Lord of glory, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, serving in the ultimate final way. And and then when Jesus says, oh, and by the way, you take up your cross and follow me. You go, oh, that's, I, I've often thought, okay, if every day I'm willing to follow Jesus to the cross and die for him, and all he asks me to do is give some money away, or all he asks me to do is help this person, I'm like, oh, that's easy compared to, to going to the cross and dying. But the point is, if that's, if we're willing to take up the cross, if we're willing to lay our lives down every day, then whatever he actually calls us to do is, is is a cakewalk compared to that. And if one day he calls us to actually lay our lives down physically, we're ready to do that too. Okay, that's that the, the vision of the cross, the call to not only see Jesus on the cross, but take up our cross and follow him is a call to radical, humble service of, ev- of every sort. And the cross is ultimate, right? That was the ultimate humble sacrifice. Yeah, yeah. But you write in Organic Disciples that the resurrected mm-hmm. and ascended Jesus Yeah. The Savior continue yeah, yeah. to to serve. Yeah. Um, talk about how that is so powerful yeah, and, yeah. And, and surprising, yeah. I guess. You yeah. Know, that that even after that. Yeah. The, the, as, as Sherry and I were studying and, and, and prepare, we spent about three years studying and writing this book, and then the, the actual writing and the whole the whole process. And what we were really doing is looking at the life of Jesus, because we're saying, okay, we're disciples, so we're supposed to be like Jesus. So how was Jesus? How did Jesus live in ways that become a model for how we live as His followers? And so. Uh, I had a couple of different passages in our study, and we sure and I ended up talking and processing this. That were ones like I knew the passage was there, I knew the story was there, I hadn't connected it in the same way. So you know, Jesus in this life, he touched people with leprosy, he went to the broken and healed them, he 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 
cared for the outcast. He he washed feet. He died on the cross. So you know, all through his life, he served with radical, humble, you know, kind of commitment to to us. Then he dies on the cross, and he rises again. Now we're talking about the, we're talking about the risen Lord of Glory, right? At this point, oh, well, then he's got to be done serving now. I mean, you, you know, you know, he's now. I can see the the earthly incarnate Jesus serving. But now he's res- he's he's risen. This is the one that on Easter we we declare and see he's alive. He's risen again. But but while he is on the earth for these forty days, he teaches. He shows up. He reveals himself to people. But there's a beautiful picture where the disciples are out fishing, and Jesus is on the shore, and he prepares breakfast for them. You know, there's the simple service of let me prepare you a meal. Mm-hmm. If you go to someone's house and they go, oh, let me let me make let me make something for you, let me cook something for you, and you watch them in the kitchen work, you know. So, and, and, I, and I don't think Jesus went, poof, nope. you know, kind of like the, the resurrected Christ did this. <laughs> you know, he could have, and and I, but but the other sense that he he prepared this meal, and so they come and they see that there's there's fish cooking and there's there's coals and there's a fire that's been set and there's and he's and he says, I, I got a meal for you. That's the resurrected Christ. And then he ascends. After 40 days, he ascends back to the glory of heaven. Okay, now Jesus is done serving. Now he's the ascend, he's the risen and ascended Lord. But then Jesus says, says, Oh, but by the way, I'm, I intercede for you. And, and we, we learn in the scriptures that Jesus, that the risen ascended Christ is still interceding and on our behalf. You know, praying, interceding. I don't, and I don't even know, I can't wrap my brain fully theologically on what that means. But that the risen, ascended Lord of glory is on our side, is an advocate for us, is interceding for us. He's still serving his people. And so it's like this is this is the character of Jesus when he walked on this earth. And before he came, as he chose to, and you know, Philippians 2 talks about he humbled himself, came among us, he right. served. While he walked on this earth, he served. When he was risen, he served. When he's ascended, he serves. How can I say I'm a follower of Jesus right. and not, Right. Absolutely. This is this is this is who he was. This shows me who I am. Yeah. A lot about being a Christian, I think, is about not being like this world or or like yeah. our culture. Uh, in in the wholehearted worship podcast, we talked about Romans twelve and do yeah. not conform to the pattern of this mm-hmm. world. How do you see Christians humbly serving as mm-hmm. not conforming to the pattern of this world, or yeah. almost being a, yeah. a rebellion against the culture yeah. of our world? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's funny. You have people uh, who try to be countercultural and, right. and rebels, but they but most most rebel movements are actually just other forms of. They're all the same. They're all the same. Yeah, <laughs> or 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 it's rebelling. It's rebelling against it, the way that they rebel. It doesn't have a redemptive nature to it. it it's just True it's too. either destructive or neutral or just sometimes just goofy and silly, you know. Uh, and yet, if you want to start a rebel movement, if you're a high school student or a college student, and you say every chance I notice. That I can step in and serve in some way with with a not not to show off, not a prideful right. thing, but in a humble way. That's countercultural. That's that's staggering. If if like you said earlier, if just holding a it's disappointing that when you hold a door, people are so excited. Oh well, thank you so much. That's it's all like, wow, that's a such a rare thing. It's like, well, that's great, but can I can I go beyond just holding the door? How do I how do I look for opportunities? How do I say I'm gonna take some of my time, my energy, my resources, and serve somebody, mm. uh, somebody who may be another Christian, a fellow Christian, or somebody who may not be. And again, all of these different parts of our spiritual growth can lead us out to change the world for Jesus. And non-believers who see Christians who are self-centered, demanding, uh, overly opinionated, it can repel them. But if they see Christians who are truly humbly, quick to serve others consistently, and they're watching in the workplace, and man, they're they're the first one to help out. They're the first one to serve someone else. They've got that kindness and willingness to serve. That that says something. So I, I think we can just we can find all kinds of ways in any aspect of life where we just say, uh, I'm, I'm going to live a countercultural life. And that, and that stands out. For each of these topics, I think it's easy to say, for any of us to say, ah, that's not my thing. Like, I'm just yeah. not going to. What do you say to the Christian who says, you know, serving people, it's just, it's not my yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah. I'll probably just ask the question, is being like Jesus your thing? <laughs> you know, I, you know, because, and this is one where it's like, well, I'm, you know, and you know, my life is full. I'm busy. Um, that's just that's just not how I'm wired. I don't notice that kind of stuff. Um, I, I would say, you know, Jesus who said, "If I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, and had we been sitting at that table, he would have washed oh, our feet yeah. because he gave his life for us." Um, I, I would just say for anyone who says, I, "I don't really like the 
humble service thing. And, and we have on our website, we have the, uh, the self-assessment tool. And so if somebody took the self-assessment and they ranked really low on that one, instead of saying, oh, I guess I'm just not good at that. So you know, how do I step it up? How do I take my next step? And so I would say, if you look and say, this is not my thing, my challenge would be to say, if you want to be like Jesus, figure out how to make it your thing. Okay, so how do I figure out how to make it my thing? What, what yeah. are some steps that I can yeah. take to practically yeah. grow in humble yeah. service? Yeah, I would say first do a deep dive on the life of Jesus and just read his life. Look at how the people with leprosy that everyone avoided, he went and touched them. He went and cared for them. The people who were outcasts, he, he gravitated. He, he didn't just humbly serve. He humbly served the people that nobody else would serve. Right. So, so if you're a Christian, look closely at the life of Jesus. That, that will get you started. Then um, to take first steps. St- you know, start, if, 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 you're, if, you're walk, if you're in the store and you're walking towards the checkout and you're looking and you're going, okay, which is the fast? Which is the shortest line? Which is the fastest? And and then there's, there's a lady coming along here. She's got a basket. And you're going, if I just pick up my pace a little bit, I can beat her there. And you beat her there, and you're like, yeah, I got you. Okay. They go, well, wait a minute. Maybe 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 what I do is I st- pause and step back. I give the person a smile. I say, oh no, please, you go ahead. And that might cost that might cost you three minutes or five minutes. And then maybe during that three or five minutes, you pray for that person that you let go ahead of you. You 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 pray for people who are working there, and you're thinking where we're at right now. And say, I'm Lord, I'm thankful that they're actually working. They're not sitting at home, uh, not working, but they're they're out here, you know, working hard at something. And you and you pray for people, and you use that time in a different way. But begin to find, you know, take note of those things. Look for opportunities. Think about the places where it's toughest to serve. I think one of the toughest places to serve is in your home. Mm. Um, no because you get there after a long day of whatever it is you do, and you're like, okay, now I can be just me. I can be selfish, self-centered, unhumble me, and bring me something and whatever you know it is. Uh, and, uh, and and just say, wait a minute, how do I plan ahead to be willing to serve with the right attitude in my workplace, in my home, where I go to school, in my neighborhood? Um, right now, there's great opportunities. I think as hopefully, prayerfully, the world starts to open up a little bit more to be able to see neighbors more and see other people and mm-hmm. say, is there anything I can help you with? Is there anything I can do for you? Uh, and just look for those and start with small things and then build on that and start with small things and then start with consistent small things and then bump it up a little bit and just kind of keep turning that notch up until, until you're like, uh, it can, it can almost become, and this is an area I've, I'm always working at growing because I'm a lot of my work is giving and helping and serving. And so then, and when I'm like done working, which isn't very often, I'll, I'll be kind of like, Okay, now it's it's kind of me time, and that's one of the toughest things. Now, now I'm in me time, and all this God says, but here's an opportunity to go. Okay, Lord, right. give me the strength, step into it. Yeah, and it's not just you. I yeah. I do fancy myself one who's naturally designed by God to serve others. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but just like everybody else, I hit my limit at one point, yeah. and and I've recently found that that's the moment that I have to actually mm-hmm. count that serving mm-hmm. when I want to do it mm-hmm. naturally. Mm-hmm. Now nah, that's not really sacrificial that's yeah. not humbly doing yeah. it. that's just doing what makes me feel good yeah but then once i've hit that line and i'm like i'm done i'm so tired that's when yeah. it's like yeah. okay now you're actually yeah, yeah. somewhat serving like yeah. jesus not yeah. even close but but somewhat yeah. there you always have a, a story an example a person mm. in everything it seems like that oh they were the picture of it mm-hmm. who's someone in your life that you could say they were a model of humble service mm. to me yeah there's been a lot of them uh, by God's grace. Um, early on as a, as a new believer, there was a guy who was a college student. I've shared a lot about him through the years uh, named Doug who just drove me around and uh, drove in his Volkswagen and took me places. Oh, my, yeah. my sister Gretchen, uh, who uh, who's very quiet and shy, but she started sharing Jesus with me, uh, doing helpful things that really bugged me because we, we, knew, we, had, we had this balance of power where we both didn't like each other. We fought all the time. It was just wonderful because you knew exactly what you were dealing with. And then she became a Christian, started being nice to me, started serving and doing kind things. I didn't know how to, and at first I would just keep retaliating, but then she kept being nice. And so, and that was part of what God used to soften my heart and open my heart to the gospel. Her, her humble service, Doug's humble service. Um, you know, I, I think of my, my wife, Sherry's parents, uh, Sherman and Joan Vlaine. Uh, they, at one point I was talking to Sherwin and I said, Sherwin, how long have you been, how long have you been teaching? I, I, I won't get exactly right. And he could correct me. I said, how long have you been teaching 10th grade Sunday school? And he said, oh, for like about 12 years at fourth reform church where Sherry grew up. And I said, do you enjoy it? He goes, oh no, no. no. <laughs> so I said, do you enjoy the kids? And he said, oh, that's kind of tough. So why are you doing it still? He says, well, they asked me to do it back then and nobody, nobody told me I could stop. <laughs> 
I actually said to him, sure, when I said, you know, maybe you should think about where you're passionate and enjoy. And then we kind of thought strategically about ways right. that he could maybe serve in a way that leveraged some other parts of who he is because he's an incredibly gifted guy. And Sherry's mom, both him, but both Sherry's dad and mom's like, well, if there's a chance to serve, well, sure, okay, what can I do to help? And uh, there's a beauty to that. Mm-hmm. And there's there's a part of me that longs to have that kind of a, I I will often serve because I'm working at it, I'm trying to be intentional. Um, if I'm if I'm at the end of kind of my own energy level, I'll, and I see somebody coming, I'm like, oh, no, 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 don't. You know, and and I'll, I'll, so I can, I have to work, work on my heart there. But there's people I've watched who just, they have a heart to serve. And, and if they, um, you know, Sherry, Sherry's dad is really, um, gifted at building things at fixing things he can fix anything he was a certified as a welder and electrician a plumber um and so he he, you know, he built his own house and i mean he wired the house he built the cabinetry everything and it's just a it was a, he built this log cabin house just a work of art um and so somebody with those kind of skills people are off like hey sherwin right. can you help out and <laughs> and so many times i would watch him and it just and i knew he was tired i knew he'd be like yeah you know let me i'll, I'll come by in about 15 minutes and just kind of recoup a little bit and then and, and, and so that, that um, I think God delights in that, yeah. How did the humble service of others lead you to Jesus or to get a picture of yeah. the Savior even before yeah. you were a Christian? Yeah. Yeah, people like, people like Doug, people like my sister Gretchen, um, people like the youth pastor, Dan. Um, I just watch these people who... Initially, I thought, I was, I was kind of thinking, they're a bunch of suckers. Right. You know, they're, I think, you know, they're... they're um, just always being nice, and you could, you know, you could really, you could really use these people. There's, you know, and, and and I wasn't thinking that overtly negatively, but it's just kind of like, well, sure, yeah, if you'll drive me here, or there, if you'll do this, you're great. You know, and here's here's some more, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, but with time, I began to look and realize, oh, this this is, this is who they are, and they're different, and there was that compelling nature of seeing somebody who lived differently, who loved differently, who cared differently. Who and who really didn't care if, if I if I was if I was self centered and took advantage of them, um, they didn't really care mm-hmm. uh, because that they weren't doing it for a payoff. They were doing it because that's who they were. That's who they were becoming in Christ. And so, uh, so those kind of those people like that who live with this consistent service made me aware that it, it made me wonder: Is there a God who who cares the way that they're showing this care? Is there a, is is there service? What, what gives them the power and the strength to do that and to not care about the stuff that everyone cares about? Right. And I began to recognize that there was a God at work before I became a follower of Jesus. And so they were, in a sense, they were helping me walk towards Jesus before I ever put faith in Jesus by seeing somebody who lived like Jesus. You maybe start wondering, why are they doing this? Absolutely. And like yeah. that word why can really mm-hmm. open up the door to yeah. the yeah. good news of Jesus. Yeah, at first it was just like, I'm glad they're doing this. This is <laughs> right. very helpful for me. But with time, it be, that why became to grow, yeah. So here now in our lives, I know you gave some some examples earlier of, of how we can generally um, take some steps. Um, how can we serve with a humble, again, humble impact right yeah. where we are in our lives? Yeah. Yeah. You said our home is one of the hardest yeah. places, yeah. Um, but what about in our community? Are there yeah. are there other ways for us to really embrace mm-hmm. this idea of humbly yeah. serving yeah. in our in our areas? Yeah, I think I w- I think I would focus on the word the word humble and the concept right. of humility. I think most of us. We'll do things, you know. It's like, oh, we need somebody to help coach this team. Oh, I'll help out and coach the team. We need somebody to to be on this on this committee to plan this thing. Oh, okay, great, great, fine. You need someone, I'll be there. I can mm-hmm. I can give a little bit of time. Um, hopefully, most of us, when the time is right, are willing to help out with stuff. Right. But the humility part is is one that says, um, I don't think I'm above this. I'm not going to come at it with sort of a sneering. Oh, okay, fine, I'll do it. And this, uh, but we come and say, you know, Lord, what a privilege it is. To serve others and help others, what a privilege it is to help these kids learn, um, you know, learn this sport or you know, learn this this activity, and what a what a privilege it is to help out my community in this way. I'm gonna show up and stripe the baseball fields or the softball field. You, know, you go, you go, and you can be out there. You know, you come out there, you know, stripe, you know, run a little stripe machine, push the thing, throwing the chalk down, do it. You're gonna go, okay, get it done, get it done, get it done. I'm out of here. Fine, that I'm done. I check that off my list. Or is there a sense of Lord, what what a what a privilege, and I'm not above this. I'm not just trying to grind through this, but I recognize that serving other people, and as a Christian, serving other people with the heart and the love of Jesus is, is becoming like Jesus. And that's what Jesus, you know, you, you can't read the Gospels and study his life and not see that this is who Jesus was, that the pre, 
incarnate Jesus, the one Jesus who walked on this earth for you know 30 plus years, the Jesus who rose from the dead, and the Jesus who ascended to heaven, all the way through is serving. You go, okay, as I'm serving, do I want to do I want I'm gonna check my my spirit. I'm gonna check my heart. I'm not gonna just do it out of duty. I'm not gonna just do it because it's for the kids or for the community. But I'm gonna say, Jesus, I want my heart to be a heart that says, This is what I do because I'm a follower of Jesus and this is what my Savior did. So I, I would focus on the humility part because I think most of us really look, there's things we do, but in many cases if we really analyze it, we go, I do it with a really crummy attitude. It's check it off the list, be done with it, and and I probably won't do it again because this mm-hmm. is not that much fun. Or is it, what an opportunity. Yeah, yeah that's, uh, I, said, I said I would have something that would mm-hmm. stick with me and I hope that all the listeners will have that. Uh, I'm reminded of my years of coaching. Yeah. Um, and I'd brag about being mm-hmm. a coach. Yeah. Um, or when the days were in, if you're the home team, you've got to come in and do the field. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and I got to do the lines. And I'm like, yeah, I was here two hours before the game, yeah. before yeah. the kids even came. I'm a martyr now. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Um, that that's it's not like that was so far in my past that it's not. Yeah. Contemporary yeah. right yeah. now, but yeah. so I've got this realization of, yeah, real yeah. humble service isn't a victim attitude in yeah. the serving. It isn't being prideful in in what you're doing. Cause you know, sometimes you can serve and you're on the board of something mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. like that's really easy to not be humble. Like, look at this. I was yeah. on the board yeah. of this school or this yeah. social, um, I can push people setting, around and make, know, make stuff absolutely. happen. Yeah. yeah. Um, so how, the, in the, along those lines, when we have these opportunities, maybe in our social settings or in our, our play mm-hmm. settings, how can we increase our action in, in serving? So, yeah. Humility, we, we've got yeah. that part. Mm-hmm. How can we yeah. increase our opportunities or yeah. take advantage of yeah. the, the serving opportunities? Yeah, yeah. so, we, so yeah, you're right. We, you kind of we got the heart right. I'm trying to do it with the right attitude. And I'm, that's an ongoing battle. But you say, okay, right. now I want to ramp it up. Right. Well, one thing I would say is it, being a humble servant doesn't mean I'll say yes to everything that comes along right. because it's impossible. There, right. the, the, there's an endless ocean of need surrounding no us, doubt. right? For sure. Uh, but to ask the question, Lord, is this for me? I think as a Christian, when an opportunity comes, when you see, and, and when you start to slow down and notice, okay, there's an opportunity. I could serve there. I could serve there. I could serve there. If you come to Shoreline Church and you and you you know go on our website and look at opportunities to serve, you go, well, I, I'll do it all. No, you can't. There's you know we, there's there's uh, dozens, if not more than a hundred opportunities and ways right. people can serve. You can't do it all. So to say, I'm going to have my heart right. I'm going to notice and look for opportunities, and then I'm going to I'm going to pray and say, Lord. Is this one for me? And and how long is this for me? You know, Sherry's dad, you know, maybe after two or three years might have said, hey, you know what, this has been nice, but what I really love to do is, you know, help upkeep some things around the facility or there's things I'm more passionate about. Um, but to say, is this, is this for me? And and it's hard for a person that really wants to be a servant to learn that you can say yes to certain things and no to other things. And that's, and that's a, you know, you can feel like it's hard to say no to something because I'm a Christian. I love Jesus. I want to be like, and Jesus never said no. Well, that's not actually true. Jesus right. did at times say no. Mm-hmm. And, and I've studied I've, that and thought a lot about that. I was, yeah. once heard of this book called No is a Beautiful Word. No is a be- Hope and Help for the Overextended <laughs> and Occasionally Exhausted. Uh, yeah. And, and, and that's why I wrote a book about learning to say no because, but, but you're saying no to the wrong things so you can say yes to the right things. Right, yeah. And so like every, you know, every year for 11 years, I would pray and say, Lord, should I still be a coach with the AYSO, American Youth Soccer Organization? And I would coach one or two or three teams. And if my boy, I tried to get my two of my boys to get on the same team right. so I could do a BLS. couple, right. couple teams. But, um, but I enjoyed it. But also for a stretch of time, it was like my Saturdays were off limits, my practice days, and people would call me, "Hey, can you do this or that?" And I'd be like, "Nope, I'm, you know, I'm." And I try to, again have the humble, humble, right attitude. They're not like, "Oh no, I got to do this," but to say, "No, no, I can't, I can't make it." And, but I look back now and, and, and all those years, and I, I would say, Lord, is this, is this not just a thing I can do, but is this a place you would want me? Mm-hmm. And so, and, and when I felt that, then when I felt the, the Lord was saying, this is a place for you to serve, then it's, I think it's easier to keep a humble heart and the right attitude because you know it's, there's a sense of a calling. Mm-hmm. And, if somebody, and if somebody courses you and manipulates you and pressures you into doing something, that is a recipe for bitterness. Because mm-hmm. it's like, Oh, or they, they, they didn't represent it very well or they lied about what it was. And so to look and say, uh, somebody might bring an invitation. I might notice an opportunity. Now I'm going to pray about it. And then if I prayed about it and I feel like the, the God, I feel this, you know, however God speaks to you and you're just, I feel like conviction, that's the right thing or this piece of my heart, I should step into that. Then I go into it with the right attitude and I try to maintain that right attitude. Not meaning that at times you can't be like, oh, I'm, 
ah, it'd be nice this Saturday if I wasn't, you know, if I could go do this, this or that with my friends, but nope, the Lord's called me to this. And so then, and, and I, and I think also give yourself the freedom to wrap something up. You might be serving humbly in a, in a certain way. And then that has run its course and then say, okay, Lord, what's, what's next for me? And, and making sure you have that balance in your life where you do lots of stuff, but that part, I think every Christian should always be able to identify there's at least one or two places where I am having the privilege of serving in the name of Jesus and seeking to do it in a way that, that looks like Jesus with the heart of Jesus. Whenever we look at the the Christian faith, we look at individual responsibility and mm-hmm. uh, individual growth and steps, mm-hmm. but there's also the, the, the corporate or the... Yeah. the community together um, or, or the church's role yeah, in that. Yeah. How do you see the local church yeah. um, creating a culture of home, yeah. humble service? Yeah. And then how do you see that impacting the local community? Yeah. yeah. Well, we did the first podcast together and we're talking about this idea of four generations, right? Mm-hmm. You say, okay, so in each of the markers of spiritual growth, so humble service is an indicator. We, we see it in Jesus. We want to become like Jesus. So we're going to grow in humble service. Well, it's not just that I'm growing in humble service. I'm fi- I'm looking for people who can mentor me, inspire me, and teach me how to serve humbly. So I'm learning from them. They're going to help me climb that hill of faith. I'm reaching to somebody else and helping them come along and teaching them. Sherry and I have often through the years uh, taken the hands of our sons and invited them into serving. So our boys were involved with helping in nursery and helping with children's program. And they, then they were involved with the worship teams. And you go, well, they're a pastor's kid. It's free slave labor. No, it's not, it's not what it was. Um, it was just helping them see that this is how Christians live. This is what we do. And my, uh, you know, and each, each of my sons in different ways are involved in ministry in at different times. One of my sons who's moved to Michigan now, um, two weeks ago, uh, with a small church that needed somebody to play guitar and, and be part of the worship team. Um, he's in the, in the financial world now, but he's like, I just asked him about the church he's kind of been connecting with. He said, oh yeah, I'm going to get a chance to, I think he's going to lead one song and be play guitar for the other songs. And, I, and maybe as a dad go, okay, all those years of saying, no, this this is what we do. This is how we live our lives. Um, now he, he's an adult. He's got to make those decisions now. But but I think it was that influence mm-hmm. over that time of this, this is how we live our lives. Not because it's your job, but because you're a Christian, because you're a follower of Jesus. So I would say, that, and then to teach those people to in turn teach the next generation, whether it's family members or friends, uh, new believers. And so I think I think that the way that we influence the, our congregations, we influence the world, is not just saying, I'm going to serve with humility, but saying, I'm going to encourage others to do the same. Friends who are Christians, family members who are Christians, and to, to talk to people about um, what it what it means to live a life of humble service uh, we can model it but i think we can also encourage others to take their next step people that we know and we have a relationship with and i think we continuously go back to also being like jesus mm-hmm. but also sharing our faith yeah uh I, I i know you believe that there is a very strong connection yeah. between living a life of humble service yeah. and living a life of evangelism yeah uh, as, as we wrap up yeah can you give us a picture of what that looks like yeah. and how those yeah. two go together? Yeah. I can go all the way back to when I was not yet a Christian and and watching how Doug would drive me places and be willing to help out, never ask for gas money, humbly served, and I saw Jesus, how my sister Gretchen would clean my room or do, do we, we always had a list of chores on our refrigerator. We had three magnets with our names and the kids. And my, every week we had different chores. Somebody says, Gretchen would do some of my chores and I'd be like, and she said, well, I just wanted to, I just wanted to you know, care for you. And I was like, oh, and I, you know, but you know, and and the people that had modeled that for me helped me see Jesus, opened up my heart to Jesus. So I think we can do the same thing. We can, um, and I think it's two parts to it. One is serving humbly, being consistent about that, um, looking for those opportunities. The second is when people do ask that why, when people are, are struck by um, the fact that that's different, that it's countercultural, it's not the way everyone else behaves. Uh, to be able to say, you know, I really... When people ask me, why do you do what you do? Whatever, in whatever area of life it is. Mm-hmm. If, it's, if it's because I'm a Christian and I'm different, why don't you do this or why do you do this? Um, my first question I always ask is, do you really want to know? Because I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about something <laughs> that you're just going to be putting, I don't want to put you off. And right. if they're like, yeah, I really want to know. And I'll say, well, um, I serve people because um, I believe that there's a God who made me, who loves me, and who served me with his own life and gave everything for me. And not only, did, not only did Jesus serve and give his life for me, but he actually calls me to do that. To me, it's, it's, a, 
it's an effort to be more like Jesus. And if you, I'll share more if you want me to, or that, if that's enough, that's fine. Let me know. But, but it really grows out of my relationship with Jesus. And if you want to hear more about that, I'd love to share. And I, and I try to, you know, share a minute or two and not like go into a, okay, the door's open. Let me spend two hours and, Absolutely. you know, uh, and most people will say, no, no, say, say more. Or, and people are curious when people see a Christian whose life is actually changed by Jesus and who actually believes what they say they believe. It's a it's a curiosity mm -hmm. in a good way. People are like, well, no, that's that's interesting. And 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 in those conversations, people will often say, you know, yeah, I. They'll say they'll they'll kind of harken back to their some some kind of religious upbringing or some kind of thing. And you know, I, I used to do this, and I, and I would go with my sister and help volunteer there, and I always really liked that. And we'd go to the sometimes on Thanksgiving we go to the food kitchen we to help serve people, and that was really neat. And they'll, mm -hmm. they'll remember these moments that they stepped into that, and it creates this conversation. And mm -hmm. and again, most people that you know, who come to faith in Jesus, not because they meet one person who's a Christian right. and they jump into the gospel and they pray to receive Jesus. That can happen, pray, praise God. But usually it's over time, it's conversation, it's relationship, and humble service is so unique and so beautiful that it creates curiosity. And then when people ask about it, to be able to talk about the one who serves you, the one who loves you, and the one who loves them too and has served them as well. And it mm -hmm. opens the door for those conversations. Well, along those lines, I would love to close us in prayer. And, yeah. and I want to pray that Everyone listening to this, uh, either in the next week or yeah. way down the road, would truly be able to humbly serve yeah. in a way that would allow them to share Jesus yeah. with this world. Beautiful. Yeah. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your, your example to mm -hmm. us about humble service. I uh, thank you for this, uh, this burden you put on Kevin and Sherry mm -hmm. to, to, share, to share these books um, with this world. And I thank you for this podcast and this opportunity for us to have another avenue to, to share the way you've designed us and how you'd like to see us grow in our, our faith and in the spiritual marker today as we're talking about humble service. I pray that you would use us as we put this together, as you would use us that are listening to this to, to humbly serve in, in our churches and in our families and in mm -hmm. our communities in a way that would truly open the door for us to to share about your love and your service and, and your ultimate sacrifice for your people. Yeah. Uh, so we, we thank you for what you're going to do through this. Uh, we thank you for the opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, thank you again, Kevin. Yeah. This is really good. I it's really a joy. Appreciate it. Yeah. It. Great. Thanks. Whether you're watching on YouTube or listening on your podcast app, make sure to subscribe to hear more. We'll see you next time.